And welcome, Hoosier fans, to another victorious episode of Doing the Work, the first show on the Back Home Network dedicated to covering Indiana women's basketball. This is our 92nd episode recorded on Wednesday, December 20th, 2023. I'm your host, Kathy Amos, and I am joined today by my co-host, Jeff Marlowe. And today we'll be breaking down your number 16 slash 15 Indiana Hoosiers 109 to 56 win over the Evansville Purple Aces. The Hoosiers have now won eight in a row since they dropped that game to Stanford early in, in the season, and their record is now nine and one. But as we do every show, we will start our show with a Hoosier Proud banner moment. And Jeff and listeners, for me, I'm going to go back to somewhat early in the, the game, right in the first quarter. I don't have the exact time, but Sarah um, missed a three, which, you know, we didn't miss a whole lot of shots, which we'll we'll talk about. You know, Sarah ended up three for five on her her field goals, three, three point field goals yesterday, but she missed a three point. Um, she goes down and plays defense and she steals the ball and then she comes down and drives um, down the other end on a fast break. She got cut off at the baseline, but she backed it back out to Sydney, who did hit her three. And I, I picked this as my banner moment because I thought this was a nice highlight of how the team played yesterday on um, – was that Monday? Yes. Monday. Sorry. <laughs> I'm losing track of my days anymore. So I thought that was just a really great example of how the team played really well together. They were really hustling on both ends of the floor and they did it from the beginning until the end. And so, like I said, this was something that happened very early on into the first quarter. And so it really, to me, was just in indicative, again, of how the team was playing and how they were really sharing the ball. Again, we'll talk about numbers later in the show, so I won't go into them now. But this was just a highlight of they missed a three, rare, got back on D, had a really great defensive effort, went down, couldn't make it, but passed it back out for an assist to a three-pointer with Sydney on, on the wing. And to me, that was just sweet, such great teamwork as well. So for me, that was our Hoosier Proud banner, banner moment. And as always, our banner moment is brought to you by Homefield Apparel, presenting sponsor of the Back Home Network, who includes Assembly Call and Crimson Cast. Homesfield is constantly releasing new schools or updating their products for schools in their existing line, so you're bound to find something for you or anyone in your life that just loves great collegiate gear. And right now, they have all kinds of different things going on. I think they're still having the 12 days of home field going on. Um, but if not, they usually have some kind of special or new things coming out. So I'd highly recommend you keep an eye on their Twitter account or just sign up for their newsletter. And not only do you get quality apparel, but you are supporting an Indiana-based business that has its roots in the Kelly School of Business. So go to homefieldapparel.com. And if for some reason it's still your first time ordering, you can use our promo code HOME23 to get 15% off your entire first order. That's promo code HOME23 for 15% off. Once again, the website is homefieldapparel.com. Wear one for the team. So let's start off with just a few news and then we'll kick it over to Jeff to get his initial thoughts about the game <clears throat> on Monday. So um, I, I kind of alluded to this in our banner moment, but the team ended up shooting a whopping 71.7% field goal percentage, not free throw. In fact, their field goal percentage was higher than their free throw percentage in this game. They shot that against Evansville and that was a program record. And in fact, it's the highest division and division one so far this year. So really just remarkable shooting from, from the ladies on Monday night. <clears throat> Also, voting is now open for several postseason awards. We have three Hoosiers eligible, Mackenzie Holmes, Yardan Gorzon, and Sarah Scalia. Voting can be accessed through the IU website or at hoophallawards.com. Hoop hoop. <laughs> if you can spell it, you can get there. Hoophallawards.com. All right. Enough of me babbling around here and stumbling through my intro. I'm going to kick it over to Jeff now for his Marlowe's musings. Jeff, what's on your mind today? 
Yeah, it's Hoop Hall Awards. It does. I see how you get the tongue tied. It's Hoop Hall Award, HoopHallAwards.com. But realistically, the easiest way is to the IU Hoosiers website. If you go to the women's page, there's a link there for you, a little like a little box that I clicked on that took me there. So I but I thought I would put both things in there for the run sheet. All right, and you know what what can we say? Monday night was exactly kind of what the doctor ordered for this team. They had not played maybe their best basketball going into, you know, with a couple of the non-conference games, especially a couple of the conference games on the non-conference games on the road. They didn't play a, a A plus game or an A game at at Rutgers and, and such. So come back home and and again, kind of back to what we've talked a little bit about, Kathy. There is a difference to being at home. And I, and, and again, Evansville is a sub 300 opponent. I mean, this was not going to be our best test. Green, and we're going to talk about Bowling Green. They're, I think Bowling Green will give them a better test on Friday um, and it, from that standpoint. But it was just good to see I thought the ball moved a little better. I thought Mac Mac played really well, even though she had a few turnovers. But again, a lot of that was coming because Evansville was double and sometimes triple teaming her. But the others really picked up the slack, which is what you want to see uh, from that. And I thought there was an interesting comment that Coach Morin made in the post game that um, that McKenzie isn't quite to where she was last year defensively. That she, you know, basically said she's not playing at the level of the Big Ten Defensive Player of the Year from last year. So I thought that was an interesting comment. With you know, it just kind of goes back to some of the things we've seen in some of Coach Morin's comments and things we've talked about here in some of the post game shows. That defensively, they're still not quite where she wants them to be to the standard that she has. And and, and we maybe this team won't get there. But I thought I, I thought that it was a good game coming out. Out of the long layoff with finals, and and I thought that the the players looked very good, and it may have been the best game. Again, wasn't the best team they're going to play, but I thought it's the best game overall that they've put together in a while. Yeah, I would agree with that. And um, well, shoot, let's just get into the details of it, Jeff. You want to start us off with some pivotal plays? Anything that you wrote down? Again, one hundred nine to fifty six. I don't know how many pivotal plays, but maybe there's a few few that we can kind of point out here. I, I'm going to go back into the first half, and this was early. I mean, she'd hit a couple shots, I think, already. But Yarden Garzon t- got the ball and on the wing, drove into the lane, got took the bump, took the hit, and got fouled and made the basket and made the three-point play. And the reason I go back to that as a pivotal play, because I think I even mentioned this in one of the post-game shows here after Rutgers or, or one of the other ones in that stretch, I, I just felt like Yarden was settling for jump shots. I felt like she wasn't being as aggressive. Or even the few times they got her down the post, she just really was kind of looking for kind of a turnaround or a simple move. Whereas that play showed an aggressiveness. I'm not just settling. I'm going to attack the rim, and then teams are going to have to play me both for the dribble and for the jump shot. And I, I felt, to me, that was a good sign. I didn't know at that point she was going to end up with what she did, but I felt like, I even, and then I was on the Discord there Friday, on Monday night with that, and I may even made the comment that that's a good sign. And so that's the first pivotal play I'm going to go to. Yeah, I think we might be talking about Yarden later here in the <laughs> in the program for sure. So um, for me, I, I'm going to go on the other end of the court and also back in the first quarter around the six minute mark or so and um, talk about some defense, a great defensive possession. So Chloe Moore McNeil, I thought it was really on point with her defense in particular on Monday night, but she was really out there hounding their guard and just all over the guard with the the ball and um, <clears throat> the the guard finally threw it, tried to get it down low where Sarah. Scalia was actually guarding down low. She deflected and ended up knocking the ball away. And Evansville just couldn't recover. And we shot, we forced a shot clock violation. And again, you know, it's a night where we ended up forcing 20 turnovers from Evansville. But more importantly, we held Evansville to only 56 points, um, which is well below their average. So while their record isn't fantastic, they have been putting up around 71, 72 points per game. And we held them well below that again. And this is a theme we had seen last year, especially from um, the Indiana Hoosiers, where they really were good at holding teams under underneath their their average per per game for the most part. There were very few games where I think we talked about that not happening. And this was another example of that. And for me, that play, maybe not pivotal per se, but just again, kind of indicative to me of the kind of defense we saw from the team. I thought all night, I thought their defense was really spot on. Um, any thoughts on the defense, Jeff, before you talk about the next play you might have on your list? Yeah, I thought the defense was really good. I I agree with you, Kathy. I thought, again, um, it was as close, 
again, I, again, I, the opponent wasn't great, but I, I thought the defense got about as locked in and I hate to go into like numbers here, but they're, they're, they're the number of steals that they had was in yeah. double digits. And, and so that tells you a little bit about the, the way they were playing and the aggressiveness that they were showing. Um, but you bring up a, a really good point here as well. The defense was playing well, but we saw here in the chat with the workaholics, Mac didn't have a field goal in the first half and they were yeah. still up. They were still up. Uh, I'm trying to do the math real quick. They were still up 23. Um, yeah. 20, Chloe, 50, I don't think, I don't think Chloe scored a bucket till the fourth quarter and, and That's we right. were still winning. So it, it didn't have to necessarily be scoring here. And you talk about that maybe as a pivotal play, it didn't have to be scoring from the big guns, you know, to, per se. It was that the team was really giving us a good effort overall. Yeah, I, I would absolutely agree with that. Um, did you have another play in particular you want to talk about? Or we can also just talk about overall some of the individual play that yeah. we had to, seen too from other from players too. I think yeah, there's a lot to cover. So yeah, yeah, let's do that his too. But I'm gonna go back and again, I think it was in the first quarter. Um, and again, I, I, I a lot of times I'm gonna watch and I don't write down, and I probably should when we're doing a show two days later, but but it was I believe first quarter, and I don't remember the order, but I want to I want to say it was Yarden, Sarah, and Sydney in some combination back to back to back threes and that's yeah. when we kind of really felt like we were breaking the game open and yeah. for a team that had struggled its last game out on the road but if for a team that had struggled at times shooting the three that that made me feel better that especially again at home it should be a little easier to shoot it you're in a more comfortable environment and the things like that but to me that was a good sign that they were they were you're going to make some threes and 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 again when you make threes this offense is going to look better like any offense will but it really opens up some things down inside for Mac and, and I want and, and and I'll throw it back to you but at some point here I think we ought to talk about Lily a little bit yeah, let's do. Let's go ahead and talk about Lily. So um, Lily, just um, throw out some numbers there. She ended up with eight points, seven rebounds, playing 16 minutes, um, no turnovers and only one foul. And she did that on four or five shootings. So back to that 71.2% that we talked about at the beginning of the show, um, she clearly contributed to that. But, you know, coming in off the bench, it's definitely something we've talked about all year is the bench play. Um, Lily has been one of the bright spots, especially coming in and, and giving McKenzie, a, you know, some rust. And she did so in this game. McKenzie ended up only playing 21 minutes. And I thought this was a really great game for Lynn, <coughs> excuse me, Lily off of the, the bench. Um, but did you have any particular place for Lily that you wanted to talk about? Um, no, but I, I, I don't want to go all Ryan here, but I, I, I don't want to, I, I will disagree a little bit. I don't think Lily's played as well here for a big chunk of the season. I think she's played minutes, but she yeah. hasn't been getting production value the way we got it from her last year. Not until Monday. Yeah. No, yeah, until Monday. And, and, and yeah, I, that's what I, I mentioned. Trying to say. Yeah. yeah and I think, I, okay. Then I, then I agree <laughs> with that part. Um, I think that we, I mentioned this even, I think, in the last post game show about the Rutgers game. I just, I just think Lily needs a game where she sees the yes. ball go in the hoop. And I really think this can now be kind of a kickstart to getting Lily to playing some really, really productive minutes like we saw from her last year. She didn't play a ton of minutes last year, maybe 12, 13 minutes a game before Matt got hurt when Matt right. was still, you know, but she was going to get you about, you could feel, you felt like you could count on five or six points a game from Lily. And that's all you really needed, you know, five, six points, four or five rebounds. I mean, I thought the other night, I thought Monday night, that was the best Lily's really looked all year. She didn't get yes. a foul for a moving screen. She didn't, you know, travel per se. She just looked like she finally had some rhythm. Yeah, sorry. That that is exactly what I was trying to say. That Monday I thought was her 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 best game this year. Okay. So um well let's just continue talking about the bench. Um, so you know, that was one thing we had talked about in our preview is that we really wanted to see some some bench. Um, production this time and that this gave them an opportunity to get some some time some meaningful time too and not just you know kind of give them a break here and there and I think we saw that Monday you know we ended up actually with 31 bench points compared to Evansville 16 and almost everyone I think actually everyone did get in because um, Ariel Wisney ended up getting in for a little over a minute there at the end and um, Sharnice um, Curry Jelks got in it with three with three minutes too <clears throat> 
So everyone ended up getting to play. And I thought we had meaningful points from them in particular. I really enjoyed watching Lene Beaumont coming in off of the bench. Again, you know, I know she's been kind of one of my favorite players I've watched this year. She's a freshman, so she's been up and down. But this was a nice game, I thought, for Lene, ending up with, you know, nine points on 17 minutes. Um and she also, you know, contributed two rebounds and only one over turnover and only one foul. And again, three or four shootings. So continuing that, you know, high percentage and very productive night we saw from the whole team, I thought Lene contributed to that as well. And I thought that Coach Morin made, I can't remember the exact comment, but basically the comment I thought uh, that I remember about out of the post game about Lene was basically she's going to be, she's going to be good. She's going to, there's a bright future there. And it just right now she's playing behind some veterans that, you know, have some experience in playing in front of her. So she's got to take her minutes and she's got to learn a little bit. And, and with that, um, Eagle Eye, I'm going to come back to that. That's a good question because I mentioned that in the Discord yes. the other night, and I will come back to that when we talk a little yes. bit. So for those of you who are in the, here on the Workaholics, because um, I honestly don't know, but it, we'll come back to it. <laughs> anyway, um, I, I have a Jules, though. Jules is one that we've kind of yeah. seen get some minutes, but it struggled maybe to put the ball in the basket. Jules finished up with six points. She hit her first three of her career. I, I really think that maybe Jules has struggled just a tad. I'm not saying this is the whole, mm -hmm. the whole thing, but it seems like Lene has, a, has been able to adapt just a little faster to maybe pace of the game, maybe some of the concepts that Coach Morton has won. But I, again, I think Jules has a bright future. But it, you know, it's just a matter of maybe she's just a step behind a little bit in that development process. But those two, in my opinion, if you get them, you know, thirty-three minutes combined, and you get they give us fifteen points on that, I'll take that every night out. Yeah, absolutely. I thought this again, you know, back to the, what we were talking about with Lily and this being her best game. I thought this was the same for Jules. Um, yep. The only slight, um, if you're going to, you know, pick on some, something for Jules would be the turnover. She ended up with three, which um, yeah, thanks for putting it up where we kind of transitioned into our notable numbers segment now kind of talking more about the bench, but you know, that was the only negative I think as a team is the 16 turnovers that we saw from yeah. the team and Jules contributed three, three as well did um, Sydney and Yarden surprisingly, but you know, there were, I thought Jules in particular, you could see afterwards, like she just was like, Oh, I wish I had that back. Oh, I wish you had that back. And to me, I think that's a good sign. Like you were talking about of how she is going to be the future for us as well. And I think just a really bright future for her and Lene as um, both in particular. So you, you can see she's just working really hard. She's learning and she's thinking about what she's doing, even when she, you know, maybe makes a mistake on the court. But she had three blocks. So yeah, she yeah. had the three turnovers, but she contributed. She had a team high three blocks. So she was being active. And, and, and I yeah. thought there was one, and, and it wasn't necessarily a pivotal play. I think it was in the, it was Jules that happened too. We were running the break and we kind of hit her with a pass and she kind of caught it on the wrong foot and it ended up going into a travel just mostly because either the pass was a second too soon or a second too late. I can't remember the exact sequence, mm -hmm. but I remember making the comment that um, that's just, you know, that's a turnover, but it just is, it was just too bad that they didn't have a little better timing on it. Cause Jules was basically going to have a wide open layup coming down. You know, she was running in the middle of the lane with that. So as well. And and let's come back to Eagle Eye's comment here in the workaholics yeah, because let's do let's all, talk about Lexi. Lexi Bargesser, you know, six <laughs> points, four steals, talking about the defense, three assists, all right, and a rebound for Lexi. But Eagle Eye, I haven't paid that much attention to her shot. I'll be the first <laughs> to admit this. But boy, she went to the free throw line the other night and she was two for four and i must not have been paying as much attention on the first two because the last two she shot and it, it's hard to describe in a podcast unless you're watching this on the live yeah. youtube feed but it's like a lean to the right you know her, yeah. her, her everything's like a little cockeyed her, her head's kind of tilted to the right and shooting it back and it also has a little bit of a side spin to it so I honestly don't know if that's the way she's always shot free throws or whether she's gone to somebody that's supposed to be like a guru of free throw shooting and help her with it. But I can't <laughs> believe, but I can't believe I'm a, I'm a little hard to believe that they haven't worked to try and change that. Cause I have never yeah. seen anybody taught that. 
I've never seen that either. And I actually, that's something my husband and I have talked about actually all year. And it's not just her free throws. If you watch her on her threes, she, she shoots her field goals the exact same way. The difference is, is that she doesn't have as much time to set up and maybe you don't have as much time to watch her, but she has the same tendency to kind of, you know, lean her whole upper body to the right. And she brings the ball back towards that right ear as well. Honestly, I, I when one of her free throws went in, I looked at Sean and I said, I don't know how any of her free throws go in because that is the strangest form I think I've ever seen. Um, but hey, you know what? She shot two of three from field goals tonight, or on Monday night, rather. So, you yeah, know, but most who am of those I were layups. Say, but they were. That's true. <laughs> Fair. She didn't take any threes, but I think that might be um, <laughs> maybe why her, I bet if we look at, you know, her three pointers, she hasn't taken a whole lot this year. And I think until, you know, they can figure something out with that. I don't know that I, I want her it's, to. It's, it, it just looks off. But back to Eagle Eye's question it's <laughs> fixable, it's just going to take work and time and whether, you know, so, but I can't believe that the staff is okay with that form, but that's my right. opinion. Maybe they right. are, maybe they know more than something I don't, and they know more than I do, but I just have never seen anybody taught that way on a form type shot. But yeah. And, and, and Eagle Eye brings up a good comment. Maybe it's eye dominance, but I, you know, <laughs> I don't know. I, I don't know what's led to it. You know, it, and sometimes you get kids like that players, it all starts when they're younger and they weren't as strong. So they get into kind of a funky way of shooting yeah. the ball that just becomes so habit forming. And they end up having some you know, good talent, high talent, and people get afraid to change it. And then by the time you get to be 20, 21 years old, it, it's like, well, is it, you know, it's hard to get out of it. Well, yeah. And it's, and they've got to this point, she's got to be a big 10 level basketball player. Do you change it? But I think it's fixable. But I was like, whoa, man. I'm so I'm gonna have to pay a little more attention to when she actually shoots yeah, a jump shot do. from now on. <laughs> yeah, because it's there, it's just maybe not quite as noticeable because you don't have as much time to to digest what she's doing. Um and, okay, and real but, quick, but overall, I thought the rest of her game was really yes, good. Yes, that's just exactly weird shooting form. Yes. <laughs> um, anyone else um in particular you want to talk about in this segment? Um, we haven't Maybe we can touch on a little bit with Chloe Moore McNeil. We haven't talked much about the starters. So Chloe ended up with two two points, um, only one of four field goals. So again, not high offensive production from her. Um, she got to the free throw line and surprisingly missed both her free throws. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't a great offensive night from her. But again, as I mentioned, you know, earlier on, I thought her defense was really, really good. And um, and maybe she wasn't putting the ball in the hoop, but she had six assists again. So she's getting it to people who can get it in the hoop. And so, you know, maybe again, not overall her best game in terms of a, a all around game, but I still thought a nice solid game from Chloe for what we would probably be looking from her, which is facilitating and defense. Yeah, I, I agree with that part of it, but you, I just think you got to get more than two points. Yeah, I think you gotta get more than two points out of uh, Chloe, and not because yeah, she has to. Be, she doesn't necessarily have to score twelve. I'm just the right. opinion that we'll get the six assists, but also get us eight points. Eight points, six assists, like you said. Right. The couple I steals, the couple. See her start driving more. You yeah. know, it, it was an anomaly. I thought only you know not making either a free throw, but only to shoot two. I thought was was strange too. Like I would have really liked to have seen her drive a little bit more. You know, Evansville was really fouling like crazy all over the place. They couldn't handle anybody down in the paint, you know, as we could see at the end of the game with McKenzie with 13 free throws and, you know, no made field goals in that first half, as we mentioned for McKenzie, but she did have seven points from the line. I thought Evansville was really having trouble um, with all of us down low. And so to me, that would have been a great game for Chloe to work on her driving. Um, but I just didn't really see much aggressive, um, offensive play from her on on monday night no and that's a little bit of a concern but again against evansville you can kind of get away with it but i, I agree yeah. with you i want to see her be a little more aggressive when we get to big 10 play at the end of the month and into next month um i'm going to go to one since we're on notable numbers here i'm yeah. going to go to fast break points 21 to 2 you know and and i've i've said this before and i know it sounds like a broken record sometimes for me because i'm such a fan of it and, I, and again i say it with the, the men too when i'm watching them or once in a while when they have me on with ac but pace play with pace push the tempo pace 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 play get get down there don't wait until the shot clock's down to like 15 or 16 to actually start getting into your offense you push the ball up the yeah. floor make the defense have to react to your pace now that may be one of the things that leads to a little higher turnover rate 
which I'm sure Terry Morin is not, you know, that's probably for her is not something she's willing to trade. I was, I was willing to play the pace and give up a few extra turnovers, but if you can play with pace and not turn it over. It takes really good discipline, but you can do it. And so, but I love the fact that they were pushing, pushing, pushing. Now, again, we got to yeah. do it against a Bowling Green. We got to do it against an Illinois and where it won't be quite as easy, but I love the idea we're getting out and running. Yeah, I do too. Um, and to your point, we did end up with 16 turnovers. So a little bit higher than mm -hmm. what we've been averaging, which I think is around 11 to 12. Um, I think the last notable number that we've been really watching all year is rebounding. And boy, did we run the rebounding battle on Monday night. We ended up out rebounding them 42 to 18. Um, so I think again, it's Evansville and we clearly have the size advantage, but I thought everyone was really aggressive. You know, McKenzie Holmes had 10, but beyond, and Lily had seven, but beyond that, it was really spread around. We had, you know, three people with five rebounds, a handful with two, a couple with one, almost everybody that played got at least one rebound. And to me, that is more indicative of, of the team trying to be a little more aggressive on the glass. Um, but any thoughts on the team's rebounding? Again, it's hard to tell here. Yes, they dominated. That was a good thing. They yeah. dominated, but Evansville was undersized. Yeah. Not a you know, not a you know, not, not a team too. that was really going to give them much problems on the glass here with that. Um, so yeah, I, I I don't have much else to say about the rebound. Good to see them dominate two to one, but I just Evansville to me yeah. not somebody that's indicative of the teams they're going to no. play that you know later on. Yeah, we'll see if it carries over to, to Bowling Green coming up on Friday. So any other numbers for you, Jeff? Uh, just the fact that the minutes got spread out. Nobody played yeah. over 26 minutes. 26. Mm -hmm. no, that was Yarden. Nobody played over 26. Hey, Kathy, help me with this a little bit because Eagle Eye made the comment, or excuse me, Brandon made the comment in the work hogs when we were talking about Lexi. Um and that, you know, that basically they don't change things in college. I think there's a lot to that. I really do. And I mentioned that already. Yeah. But who was the basketball? Who was the player that the men had? It was it Stan Robinson that yes. they that was right handed and then he started yep. shooting left handed and, you and know, then went back to right. They yeah. went back to right. That was somebody that they were trying <laughs> to change shot on. Yeah. Yeah. So, OK, Absolutely. I wanted to make sure if I had the name right. Yep. All right. Um, well, let's transition then to our award. So let's start off with our game ball award. Um, I think hopefully this will be a pretty easy one. But if you're watching on YouTube, you can see the ticker at the bottom for our running totals here for the year. But if not, I'll just read them off to you. So Mackenzie Holmes leads the way with four. Yarden, Garzon, and Sarah Scalia each have two. And Sydney Parrish has one. So Jeff, you could go first. I think this <laughs> might be easy. Who do you have for your game ball? Yeah, yeah, it's hard to overlook, but let's do say this. There we had four players um in double figures, and Sarah Scalia finished with 12 on four seven shooting. I thought Sarah played well. Sydney Sydney Parrish had 12, three of five shooting, four of four at the line, five rebounds. So I, I just want to make sure we kind of mention those two, especially right. and uh, as we move through the segment or segments. But I'm gonna go with yard here, 12 of 14. I mean, you can't bit, get much more efficient than that for a guard. Uh 12 mm -hmm. of 14, three of four on threes, three of four at the line. The one thing she didn't have was no rebounds. I didn't realize yeah. that until I started looking at this now. I thought <laughs> no, she had a piece me of too. So two assists, that happens. <laughs> two assists and two steals, but 30 points for Yard and Garzani, new career high. And and we we've talked a little bit about how Yard just hasn't seemed like she was shooting it quite as well, wasn't maybe playing as well. And again, when you have such a great freshman year, sometimes you just falling off a few points is going to look like you're not having as good a year. But oh, I thought Yarden had her best game of the year, um, and there was the 30 points. So I'm going to go with Yarden for the game ball here. Yep, uh, that that makes it pretty unanimous. I think it's hard not to give that one to Yarden. Um, you know, again, she, uh, <laughs> I don't know what else to say beyond what you said. Um, 12 of 14 shooting, but not just 12 of 14, but three of four from three point. Um, so, uh, like, I don't know what else you can ask of her. Um, don't have two turnovers? I don't know. Like, she really, Get a outside rebound. Of, like you said. Get a rebound outside of the rebounding. There's really nothing I would nitpick on her game. And, you know, she did the 30 points in 26 minutes. <laughs> so just incredibly efficient. And um, she just looked fantastic, I thought. I, and, you know, I almost liked it better than her 28-point performance down in Fort Myers because in Fort Myers, she did it with mostly threes. And here, 
I thought she showed how much of her game was well-rounded, right? There was a lot more two points than just three points. She made nine of her 30 from three points um, and three points from the line, but the rest were all two-point field goals. So, you know, she was showing us a different facet of her game, I thought, mm -hmm. than Sport Myers as well. Yeah, and let's face it, we didn't really hit on this. You did it with the news, but uh, the fact that they shot 71.7% 71 <laughs> for the game, we didn't talk much about that in the notable numbers, but it was, you know, yeah. you mentioned it in the news. So, but yeah, um, but you look at that. She was nine of 10 inside the arc. You know, when you when you break the numbers down, she was nine of 10 inside the arc. Yeah. So. yeah. Yeah, I thought, again, probably to me so far, best game from Yarden, um, not just this year, but I think of her career so far. Very well. All right, game ball. Hang on yeah. just a second. I was... um, okay, so moving. No, go ahead. I was talking to myself. Moving... Out, sorry. Oh, that was game ball. That's all right. <laughs> okay, back on track. Here we go. All right, we're moving on to the Grace Oh, 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 oh I see. I'm sorry. No, go back, go back, go back. I'll bring it back up. There we go. My bad. That's all right. Okay, so that made uh, the third game ball for Yarda and Garzone. So, <laughs> so she's she's creeping up on McKenzie. So, all right, now we will uh, officially move on to Grace Berger, hardest worker. So again, at the bottom of the screen is our ticker. Um, Sydney Parrish leads the way with three. Um, Lexi Bargasser, Mackenzie Holmes each have two. Lene Beaumont and Lily Meister each have one. Um, Jeff, I think you have an array of people that you could probably pick for this. And I had a hard time voting um, for one person and writing. I usually write my vote down right after the game with my visceral, you know, kind of thing. I wanted to kind of talk through it tonight and see how I felt. I'm not sure I still have decided, but why don't you go first and maybe you'll, you'll convince me. Again, isn't this the good problem to have when we have yes. games like this, where we can talk about multiple people. Um, any of the kids off the bench, any of the players off the bench, especially Lexi, Lene, Jules, uh, and Lily, I felt any of those four could have been the discussion, especially Lene. For me, Lene and Julie and Jules, just because they haven't maybe played as many minutes, you know, and been as productive throughout the year. But I guess I'm going to kind of be on a standby here. I'm, or maybe I'm just old out the wall, but or off the wall, but I'm going to go with McKenzie. Uh, McKenzie Holmes, 22 points. On seven shots, 22 points on seven shots, 10 of 13 at the line. She had 10 rebounds. Uh, her own negative, she had three blocks, or excuse me, three turnovers. And she, but she only had one foul and, and she only played 21 minutes. So I, I, <laughs> maybe not quite the definition of hardest worker, but I'm, I'm going to go with Mac. Yeah, I, you know, I, I was really struggling between uh, really three people and you've mentioned them all three, um, Lene, Jules and Mackenzie were the three I, I had in my head as well. Um, and, and, you know, again, 21 minutes for Mackenzie um, and six to seven shooting, but you know, she was, they were really double and triple teaming her at times and just fouling her. And so while she only took seven field goals, it was mainly because she couldn't get them off right. because they were fouling her so aggressively in that first half. You know, like we mentioned, she didn't have any field goals. So maybe it sounds weird to give her the hardest worker to somebody who doesn't make a field goal an entire half, but she got it done at the line. She had seven at the, the free throw line in that first half and she was contributing in other ways. Uh, it, you know, I've again been really watching her as she has been getting double and in this case, triple team watching how she tries to pass out of the post. And, you know, she ended, she didn't end up officially without any, with any assists, but it didn't feel that way to me. And mm -hmm. I was surprised when I looked at the box score because I thought her passing was straight on. So I can totally support McKenzie for, um, uh, the Grace Berger hardest worker award. So that brings it to three for McKenzie. And she is now tied with Sydney for, um, hardest worker. Um, before we transition into the next game, Jeff, is there any other last thoughts you have on the Evansville game? Well, no, no. The only thing I'll add in here is you talk about rebounding battle. And we had 19 assists, but we had 38 makes. So this was one of those rare games where IU didn't have like just a few assists less than their made field goals. But I think that goes back to a lot of that. We'll talk about yeah. the fast break points <laughs> because they were getting too, so many open. Yeah, I was going to say, and, and this, when you're shooting 72%, um, yeah, that's it's just really shocking to me um, that we didn't have more assists in that column. So I guess people are making more on their end, to your point, fast breaks. Yeah, 21. Mm -hmm. So, 
All right, cool. Well, let's move on then and talk about what's coming up next. So in terms of our next game for the women, they are playing Bowling Green. That game is on, on Friday, this coming Friday, December 22nd. Tip-off is at 6 Eastern, 5 Central. The game is on Big Ten Network. Um, so, Jeff, do you want to maybe talk about some of the high-level stats, and I'll cover yeah. a couple of the players that they have. Yeah, I'll take some of the team stuff. You take the, the individuals. Um, and I did look this up, and they are now um, – their net ranking now is 111. So this is not a cup. I mean, everybody's going to be, oh, it's a max school. This is not a cupcake. This is a team uh, that is only, they're averaging 68.7. I'll go through the stats here. 68.7 per game. They're giving up 71.2. Their their issue here is that the, the better teams they've played, you like to think IU is in this as well. Iowa, uh and they played South Carolina last night and gave up 90. So they've given up and they gave up 90 to Iowa as well. Uh, but they shoot 38% as a team from three. So this is a team that is kind of dangerous from beyond the arc. Uh, they turn it over 16 times a game, only force 14.6. So they're a little bit in the negative there. Um, IU leads the all-time series six to two, including four and one at Simon Scott Assembly Hall. IU won last year's game at Simon Scott Assembly Hall, 96-61. That game was on November 17, 2022. They have a new coach, Fred Schumiel. Fred Schumiel, spelled C-H-M-I-E-L, but it's pronounced Schumiel. His first season, he was had been an assistant at South Carolina with Don Staley over the last few years, big part of their run in into the final four national championships. Um, he has bounced. He's like a lot of assistants. He's been other places. He's had a stint at Minnesota, had a stint at Penn State, did some time in the WNBA as an assistant. I uh, guess just the life of an assistant coach. Their former coach, Robin Fraley. And again, we beat the thing about this, Kathy, and for the work and the people who are listening on the podcast, we beat this team 96 to 61 last year. And again, at home, a little different team. And I think that was right before that Las Vegas tournament. So Grace was still healthy. Um, but they went 31 and seven last year losing. And so one of those seven was to us and they were 31, seven Robin Fraley took that and she had had a nice run there for about four or five years. She's now the head coach at Michigan state. So we'll be seeing her a little bit later in the season, but um, they're currently six and three. They lost last night, as I said, to South Carolina, 93, 62. They lost at Texas state 74, 48. And there are other big losses at Iowa, 99-65. They're probably right now their best win is over Xavier, a 73-64 win over Xavier. But I this is a team that I'm not necessarily saying scared, but don't come, don't try to sleepwalk through this game. Yeah, absolutely. I, I you know, it, it's hard. I have to say I haven't watched much of them um, mm -mm. at all. So, like you mentioned, though, they're not afraid to play people. You know, they played South Carolina number one, number four, Iowa, um, both. You know, on the road, of course. Um, Although the South Carolina game was in Bowling Green, Ohio. So I guess not. Um, I take that back. But yeah, I mean, they're not afraid to play people at all. And, you know, uh, I think that probably speaks a lot for their coaching and, and what they're willing to do. But um, let me talk a little bit about some of their individual players here. So they have Lexi Fleming, who's a 5'5 junior um, guard. She av is averaging 16.7 points per game, five rebounds per game, three assists. Um, 2.7 steals per game, and she's shooting 43% field goal, 31% three-point field goal, and she shoots 86% from, from the line. So, you know, definitely um, somebody who can shoot the ball and make get some points for them. So she was the, the, the MAC freshman of the year in 2021 when she averaged 15.9 points per game as a freshman. Um, but she did end up missing all of 21 and the 21, 22 season, um, with an injury. So coming back off that injury, it seems like she's picking right back up where she was as a freshman with that 16.7 points per game. Um, Morgan Sharps is a 5'10 grad guard. She um, is fourth all time in three point field goal percentage. Um, she is averaging 15.8 points per game, three and a half rebounds per game. She shoots 45% field goal. And, you know, back to that three point shooting, 50% free th uh, field goal three-point shooting. In fact, she hit 25 versus, versus seven, or she had 25 points versus South Carolina and she made seven of 12 threes against there. So I think that's something we'll really have to keep an eye on is um, Morgan Sharps. Um, 
She was injured in January of last of earlier this year, rather, and she just returned in on November 23rd. So um, looks like she's really made a nice recovery, uh, especially in that game against South Carolina. Um, prior to this, she played two years at Xavier. Um, and then last, they have Amy Vel Velasco. She's a 5'7 junior guard. She is averaging 12.9 points per game, just under two rebounds per game, four assists per game, 41% field goal shooter, 48% three-point shooter, and 86 from the line. And she was the 2021 MAC Freshman of the Year. So a couple of Freshmen of the Year on their roster here and three players that average double digits for them. So again, they can put up some points and especially from the three-point line. So it seems to me, Jeff, that's probably what we're going to really have to watch, um, which also leads me to on the missed three-pointers, how we do with that rebounding. Um, and those long rebounds. But what else would you like to talk about with Bowling Green? I think. Well, and I think it took Fleming a little bit to get back. She played last year, but her numbers were down. She was actually just under 10 points a game and her time went down. So I don't know whether maybe there was some lingering parts with the injury there or whether the coach, you know, because she missed a year and the coach found somebody else, she trusted a little more, but her numbers were down just a little bit, which you don't see, a, you know, which that doesn't surprise me. It was just, I don't think she, I think she only started a handful of games last year. She played every game last year after coming back from the previous, missing the previous year. Um, but the other thing is Sharps is, like I said, had 25 last night, but she's not starting. And now that could change by to Friday. You know, she may start in Bloomington. But again, I think they're trying maybe to min mon monitor her minutes a little bit. Uh, just guessing. I don't look at their box scores that deep. But I would think they want her as healthy as possible for the MAC where they will have a pretty good chance to be the MAC champion and go into possibly – an NCAA tournament. So they may be trying to manage her a little bit and with her minutes and have her coming off the bench from that standpoint. But they really seem didn't seem like their their big players were doing a ton of work in terms of the huge production numbers. This is a very guard oriented team, which we should not have a huge problem with. But you bring up a really good point, Kathy. When you shoot threes like that, long rebounds. You got to make sure you're getting into what well, we used to try and tell players, you know, a lot of long rebounds. Somebody's got to get to the free throw line as a defender. The old days of, you know, screen out, find your man. Those are kind of really, those really are kind of going away. You, you got to find, you got to think about where balls are going to come off the rim and, and, you got to find a way you got to get somebody to you know, around that free throw line. You'd be just surprised how many you know rebounds seem to end up on threes out toward that free throw line, top of the key type area. And so you got to really go get it. Um, and you got to make sure people are there, but um, you know, so that's, you know, that that's, I just think that's a great point about the rebounding. Yeah. And, you know, back to Sharps, you know, she's only played five games. As you mentioned, she hasn't started any, but in those five games, she's averaged 24 minutes. So I think, you know, we'll, we'll see, you know, if she was injured, she's coming back from that injury as, as we mentioned, um, just returning on November 23rd, maybe they are just trying to ease her back into it. So I think she's somebody to, to, to definitely watch. Um, and, you know, they, they seem to play quite a, quite a few of their players as well. Um, so, um, Jeff, a question for you, and again, I, maybe you haven't seen Bowling Green either, but obviously it seems they really like the three ball. But beyond that, with their being pretty guard dominant, do you think that we need to kind of worry about driving? Because we know we've seen that a couple of times from our team where we have trouble when the guards kind of have that straight line drive for us and we can't quite stop it. Is that something else we should watch in this game on Friday? I don't think as much here, Kathy. I don't think they're the athletic type of guards that have given us some trouble. Um, but it, it is something I'm sure you'd want to keep an eye on. I, and I have not watched them play live, but just remembering a little bit from their stats while they shoot decent free throw percentages. I don't remember any of them having huge numbers at the free throw line. It wasn't like in, in nine games, they had been there 40 times. They were, you know, maybe 15 free throw attempts, 18 free throw, you know, maybe two, three a game. So I'm not sure they're really driving hard to the rim. I think they're, but I, what I probably see is a lot of movement, and finding, you know, maybe kicking, you know, kick, uh, drive and kick. Um, so we'll find out a little bit more about that. I just don't know enough about it. But like I said, there wasn't anybody that really just jumped off the page like, oh, my goodness, they've shot like 40 free throws in, you know, nine games. You know, there's just not I didn't I don't remember anybody like yeah. that. Yeah. Great. 
Um, what other kind of keys to the game are you you watching for? So we, we talked about limiting three points and um, maybe watching perhaps about the drive, but the long rebounding. Anything else in particular that you are looking for on Friday night? Uh, turnovers a little bit here. I, I just think that, you know, 16s yeah. more than than Coach Moran's going to be comfortable with. And I think that, you know, we got to got to find a way to get it back down around 11 or 12 and still be able to play with some, kind of the same pace. But I think also what you mentioned, the rebounding goes in here. It's kind of coach cliche stuff. It's, you know, rebound and turnovers. Can you win? You know, can you limit your turnovers? Can you keep control of the glass? Because those are things that are going to go when you when you have a mid-major team like a Mac team coming into Assembly Hall, they need every break to kind of go their way if we're playing, you know, even if we're playing our best, you know, now it helps them if we're not, you know, for you know, I won't really debate talk about what happened last night with the men, but you know, that's you know, it, you got if you're playing your best, they need every break, they need every loose ball to kind of go their way. And so that's why you really want to control those things because those are things that all of a sudden, like the 50-50 ball, the rebound that's loose that they somehow pick up and all of a sudden becomes a layup or we're turning it over 18, 19 times and they're being able to convert those into points. So it's coach, it's coach speak, I know, but those are the things I'm really, especially the turnovers. That's what I'm really watching for Friday night is turnovers. Yeah. Yeah, you know, and I for me the same, but uh, on the other end, um, Bowling Green, are, yeah, averages right around 16, 17 turnovers a game. You know, we forced twenty in with Evansville. Are, can we again kind of force those those turnovers, get those steals and stuff going on the defensive end as well? Yeah. So Jeff, point. why don't you give us our final thoughts, and then um, I'll wrap us up and send us on our way for a Wednesday night in December. <laughs> Hang on. Okay. Um, you know, just good win. And, and we talked a few times on these post game shows about, wow, just didn't feel like we played the way we're capable B plus maybe B type performances. I, I thought that was a pretty much, I was, it may not have been a plus performance, but I thought it was an a performance here night. And I thought, I thought the players coming off a long break with finals and such, I thought, I thought getting out to a good start early was huge. But again, this was this was a team that they should have beat, maybe not by 50, but this is a team that you thought they should have beat by 30. Yeah. Take care absolutely. of business. Yep. So hopefully we'll see the same from them on Friday night, taking care of business. So doing the work, if you will. <laughs> you got it. All right. Hang on a second. One thing here. All right. So, so um, coming up next, um, we mentioned already the next game is on Friday night. Um, I am going to be traveling on Friday night. I'm going back to Indiana, actually. So I will not be able to do the post game with Jeff. So we are going to come back to you on Wednesday again, a week from today. Um, get past uh, all the holidays. So hopefully you have an enjoyable Friday evening watching the women play. Um, and we will wrap that up with you on Wednesday, again, the December 27th at our normal 8 Eastern, 7 Central time. Other programming notes, Assembly Call Radio will be back on tomorrow night with another post-game show, this time after the Northern Alabama game. If you want to see us do the show live and be part of the live chat, you can make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash at Back Home Network. You can be part of our private community as well if you're not already. Find out more at assemblycall.substack.com. Again, we have all kinds of great conversations out there, so we'd love for you to join us. Hey, Kathy, special- can, I jump in? can I jump in yep. there real quick on the Substack? For those of you who are watching on the live YouTube feed or you're listening to the podcast, hey, find out see if you want to join in with Substack because with our Substack page, because we're posting some good stuff in there. At least I hope it is. Cause, and, and I'm trying to update the net ranking every Monday. I'm not going to do it every day. I, it, it changes every day, but I'm going to kind of have a period like Monday's my day. I update it and it kind of gives a, I can reference back to the previous week. Um, we're updating the rankings. We're updating uh, bracketology. We're trying as much as we can, we're trying to put as much information out there about the IU women's program as we can. So Kathy's doing a good job as putting some stuff in there as well. So, so check out the Substack page. We know it's not been the easiest transition from Mighty Networks over to Substack for a lot of you, but check it out because we're, we're, we are putting some stuff out there that is IU women centric. And so we hope you'll check that out. Yeah. And also it'd be a great place to keep an eye out because as I mentioned at the beginning of the show, this was episode number 92. 
for Jeff and I um, for doing the work. So we're closing in rapidly on 100. Um, if the schedule works out right now, it looks like our 100th episode might fall on the post game for the Purdue game. So we're going to try to see if we can come up with some kind of special idea to do that, to celebrate hopefully a win over Purdue and our 100th episode. So um, hopefully that schedule turns out um, correct for us. We haven't quite looked in depth in terms of scheduling and, and whatnot, but that's the way it is looking to shake out right now. So if you're on Substack or Discord, we'll be posting more information there, probably on Twitter as well. So hopefully you will join us again at assemblycall.substack dot com. And just to give some other thank yous out. So special thanks to John Ringer of Riggs Design. He designed all of our logos that you see. A big thank you to Bob Thompson, who just created our music that you heard during the broadcast. But most of all, thank you all that are listening live or listening after the fact. Um, we wouldn't be here without you. Otherwise, Jeff and I would just text about stuff. And that's not near as fun as being able to come on here and interact with all of you. So thank you all for listening. We'll be back again to talk IU Hoops with you next Wednesday, the 27th. Well, until then, keep your elbow in, your eyes on the rim, and let's go Hoosiers. And Jeff, I just thought of one thing we forgot to mention in the news is that we are currently, in terms of attendance for home game, ranked sixth in the nation for oh. women's basketball. Um, I meant to mention that at the beginning as well. So in, as a, a testament to that, this Evansville game had just a little over 8,200 people. So um, really great from our fans to be to be out there. And in fact, I think we had three Big Ten teams in the top 10, if I remember. It was us, um, Iowa, of course, and I believe Maryland was Maryland. also... Maryland, right? Cracked that top 10. Yeah, so, which is a yeah. little surprising. I mean, surprising per se that Ohio State isn't maybe drawn a little better, yeah. you know, with the team they have. Um, right. But again, it's nice to see us in that position. It'd be nice to be higher. And I think our attendance will go up once Big Ten season starts, especially after the students get back. We're going to, I'm actually, yeah. we're actually, the family's actually going to go down for the New Year's Eve game against Illinois um, on the 31st for that early start. We'll have plenty of time to get on the back at home on the, on, and back and safe before, you know, the crazy people hit the roads on New Year's Eve. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I think you'll see our numbers go up now, whether we'll move up in that ranking, I, I don't know how close we are to like five and four, right. but, but when Iowa basically has sold out every game already, you know, it's going to be tough to catch a, a yeah. team like that, but we do have a little bit bigger arena too. So if we start getting right. some 13, 14, 15,000 type games, then we got a chance to move up the list a little bit. Hey, by the way, when you talked about coming back to, 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 to Indiana, all I could get all through, and I'm not a big singer rapper, but the first thing that jumped into my head was like, I uh, kind of paraphrasing LL Cool J going back to Indiana, Indiana. Going back to Indiana. <laughs> <laughs> Who would have thought Jeff quoting LL Cool J tonight? <laughs> yeah, well, it's, that's there, great. Yeah. So, but yeah, that's all that's the first thing that popped in my head was like that, but Hey, appreciate all the kind comments from everybody in the workout Holly. Yeah. You know, it really does make, it fun to do the show, but knowing that people are listening, watching and, and, and getting some benefit from it. Yeah, absolutely. All right, Jeff, I think with that, we can call it a wrap and we'll talk in a week. Yep. We'll, we'll wrap it up. We'll see everybody in a week. Merry Christmas to everyone. If you celebrate Christmas or if not, um, whatever holiday you might be celebrating coming up, hope you have safe travels. If you're going anywhere and good weather and have some great food and family and fun time. So appreciate uh, everything everyone does for us. Yeah. Appreciate it. Merry Christmas. Happy holidays. And we'll talk to you next week. Yep. Bye-bye everyone. See ya.